I know that we do our very best in giving you announcements. And you said it somewhere in the side right there, Mijo. And uh, But I want you to pay close attention to this one that I'm going to take it very personal. I think that God has called me to be in this place. And I, I know I shared on Wednesday, I actually shared in Spanish, which was a great blessing to me because it's my first language. And I just roll in Spanish, right? And it was amazing. And I was telling the main church on the, on the main campus that God called me uh, for this time and this place. Uh, Pastor Ledesma and I, you know that we've been friends for quite some time. And, um, you know, we always talked about having an English congregation, an English-speaking congregation. And God worked things like he always does mysteriously. You never know where, he, where you're going to end up in life. And I, I'm here right now. And the one thing that I that I am concerned about, I'm a man of convictions, but there's one thing that I'm concerned about, and that is laying a good foundation for whatever God is going to do in this place. I cannot control the outcome of what's going to happen in, in chapel. Uh, I cannot control the outcome of how many people are going to show up every Sunday. I can't control that. But there are basics that I focus as a pastor, and those, God will honor my efforts and God will honor my intentionality as I am focused on laying a good foundation and as you are all very attentive this morning what is the foundation that I want us to build upon that is the word of God listen I, I can be the most amusing and the most entertaining preacher up here but if I am not preaching the word of God it is useless the apostle Paul says woe unto me I the me if I don't preach the gospel, not philosophy, not what the world is teaching. If I don't preach the gospel, I told you, I, I'm kind of recapping some of the things that I said on Wednesday. You make a space and a time to meet with God every single day. People ask me, you don't know how many people ask me, how can I get closer to God? You need to make time and you need to make space. I am giving you, this outline is just a tool for you to make that time and space to meet. And you, and, and Jesus may, you may not feel like it's showing up on the first time. But you make that habit of meeting with him routinely. Like all, you guys all eat every day, right? Most of you eat like three times. And I know some of you can eat like it's the last supper. Right? But you keep meeting with Jesus. And I can guarantee you, my friends, that one of the days he's going to show up. And he's going to bring out things that you don't, didn't know that were there. And he is going to minister you according to your need. You need to have one. Of the, and we don't make any money by selling these. Uh, now, I could give them to you for free. If you don't have the finances to, to make an investment, look, I will buy it for you. Let the ushers know, Pastor, that he's going to buy it for me. I will buy it for you because it's not about the money. But you need to have one of these so you can make that time and that space. They, they are outlined by the date. This morning, this morning, I already read mine. Yesterday was amazing. It talked about creativity. How many of you need creativity in your business? Creativity in finding solutions for your problems. It's right here. Every morning has a short scripture, a thought that you can focus on and start your day or close your day, whatever time you want to make that time and space to meet with God. But I am concerned and driven by laying a good foundation in this church. And I'm, I'm, I'm repeating it again. It is about building based on the word of God. There are so many attacks coming against us. That if you are not anchored in the word of God, you will be, the Bible says, tossed to and fro by any wind of doctrine. We need to be anchored in the truth. Amen. Ah, I said what I had to say. <laughs> Praise Jesus. I know there's people that are having their birthdays. Eliseo Ladesma, I know, don't hide. I, somebody said that you, somebody said happy birthday to Eliseo Ladesma. <laughs> I know uh, Leo is your birthday today, right here. That is our youth pastor right there, Leo. 
He's 21 years old. I'm not, no, you're older than that, aren't you? <laughs> and I know that David Mendoza, I think it's tomorrow, right? Where are you? Where are you, David? Come on now. God bless you. All of you guys are part of our family. We love you, and we're excited for what God is doing in your lives, and thank you for being a part of CFC English. Um, I just want to say, I know already Anthony said about Easter Sunday, <sighs> invite someone. That weekend is just special. That's our Super Bowl, okay? And I know that, I know, I know that there's new people today here for the first time. I'm not going to I'm not going to make you stand up and say your name and what you do for fun. Uh, but at the end of the service, please connect with uh, Maribel and Marco. We want to just get your number. If there's a need that you have, we want to pray for you. We want to reach out. If you don't have a place to worship, we want you to worship with us. Things are happening in CFC English. And it's not because of us. It is because of him. So we want you to be a part of our family. So... Uh, with that, uh, with any further ado, did I say it right? With, for, without further ado, let us get into the Word of God. Sabrina, good to see you back. And you, you, you kept your promise. You brought someone with you. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for being in our midst and I know that when we approach your presence, the problems are not going to disappear. But you give us a different perspective on how to deal with them and how to release them into your care. And this morning, we're going to talk about grace and mercy. Oh, how we need your, how much we need your grace and your mercy. This morning, give me favor to speak before your people and let our hearts be quickened by your spirit to put into practice what we are going to learn this morning. Give me the grace, Father, to just flow with what you want to speak to us. And I entrust this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have, we've been in a five-week sermon series of God's promises. Last week, we talked about forgiveness. This morning, we're going to talk about grace and mercy. We talked about last week about, like I said, forgiveness. But we've talked about faithfulness, wisdom, purpose, Things that God has given us as promises, rock-solid promises that can help us navigate our journey through life. Forgiveness, I said last week, is not offered and given because we deserve it, but because God has chosen to forgive us through Jesus Christ and His atoning sacrifice. If you need an outline, I know Moises has one available, but please take notes this morning. But when we talked about forgiveness... It is not based on your merit. It is not based on what you have done. It is not based on your own accomplishments. It is based on what Christ did for us. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. On Friday, I was out in TJ. I was doing a funeral service of someone that tragically lost her life. And I say tragically because it was completely unexpected. She was a woman that was healthy as far as we knew it. And in the middle of the day on Wednesday at noon, she was getting herself ready, how ironically, to go to a funeral. And in her bathroom, while she was getting herself ready, she had a fatal heart attack. And that was the end of her life. But when we think about those things, I was sharing on Friday, and I was, as I was driving to TJ, we, we literally were in the border trying to cross into TJ for two hours and 45 minutes. Two hours and 45 minutes in my car with my wife and my children, the ones that accompany me. And during that time... I, the Holy Spirit put in my heart this boldness, and I said, this tonight, I will be bold and tell people that the only way they can have life is through Jesus Christ. And I knew there were going to be people from different religions, and I didn't care. I didn't care about being politically correct or not stepping on anyone's toes. All I wanted was to share 
about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I knew that that, that boldness can only come as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak on God's behalf. And I remember, why am I saying, telling you this? Because clearly I told that, that group of people, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. My friends, there's no other way to approach the presence of God. See, we may think, well, can God lower his standard just a little bit? Next week, we're going to talk about holiness. Because that is something that we cannot have in the back burner in our lives. God is a holy God. There's no lowering His standard. A holy God that cannot tolerate sin, cannot turn His back on our sin and simply say, forget about it. He can't. But what He has done is He has provided a way for sin to be dealt with. And that is through Jesus Christ. God promises us as believers, grace and mercy, and both can only come through Jesus Christ. See, you cannot talk about forgiveness without talking about grace and mercy, for they are woven together in God's plan for mankind. Grace and mercy are part of God's redemptive plan for us. What, what does grace mean? It's going to be in your outline. I'm going to give you like seven different things that grace means. I want you to jot them down really quickly. But I'm also going to give you a scripture that I want you to take home and read it upon maybe this afternoon, maybe throughout the week. So take notes. Grace is undeserved merit. And I'm, the scripture I'm going to give you is not out there, so I'm going to be attentive. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Grace is God's undeserved love. Remember that verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. John 3, 16. Good to see you here, Alfred. I missed you, bro. Number three, God's undeserved salvation. Don't know about you, but I did not deserve to be saved, Stephen. But well, he loved me, and undeservedly, he saved us. The, the, the verse that I'm giving you is Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. Number four, God's undeserved forgiveness. Isaiah 43.25. He says, Isaiah 43.25. God's undeserved relationship. Jeremiah 32, 38. Jeremiah 32, 38. God's undeserved power. It is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. That verse is, is one of the first ones that I memorized, Lala, when I became a, a Christian. Said, for my grace is sufficient, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Number seven, God's undeserved blessings, Ephesians 1 3. I'm going to tell you one thing that I was reading throughout the week. Think about when Jesus was tempted. You don't have to be a Bible buff to know this. It is common knowledge. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he didn't appeal, listen, he didn't appeal to his nature as the Son of God to come against the devil. He didn't say, I am the Son of God, therefore leave me alone, right? He didn't. In every instance where he was tempted by the devil, in each one of them, the prescription was, it is written. It is written. Patrick, something happens when you write the Word of God and you memorize the Word of God. And whenever the enemy, I'm giving you something that may save your life right now. 
I'm giving you the word of God. There are things in your life that will not change until you quote the word of God and you tell the enemy, it is written. I'm passionate about this. And there's, and there's just freedom to preach the word of God this morning. So I'm giving you nuggets that will be that you can use them when you are facing the enemy square on. Grace is all of these elements that I just told you. In other words, God offers to us what we do not deserve. I'm imperfect. I can fail you. I, I, I can mess up in my life. If not, ask this woman that is sitting on the first row. That's my wife. 30 years married. Ask my children in the back row. They've seen me fail. They know the mess ups in my life. But I can make an appeal to the grace of God and say, God, thank you for you offer me something that I didn't deserve. Amen? Thank you. Amen. God is good. A holy God that gives instead of taking. He gives to us where he could be justified to take it all away. Because we were not perfect. But he loves us where he could leave us. To be eternally separated from him. See, mercy is not getting what you deserve. For all the times that I have messed up, I deserved punishment. But by the mercy of God, he didn't give me that punishment. He gave me grace because of what Jesus Christ, our precious Savior, did on the cross for us. See, grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. And mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. When you have this first and far front, and in the front of your thinking, of your livelihood, it changes your perspective. It changes the way you deal with problems. See, society now now has a, a, an outright attitude that, that somebody owes me something. And I'm not picking up on the, I'm not picking on the millennials. Or, or what is it called? Gen Z? What's, what's, I don't know all the X, Y, and Z. And, and I don't know them. But I'm not picking on you guys. Society as a whole, we think somebody owes me something. We have the sense of entitlement. Those that have must be given to those that have not. My rights, my feeling, my pleasures, my money, my time. The world has very little compassion for others, but it is quick to yell foul when somebody else wrongs them. You and I, we were doomed because of our many sins. In fact, we were going to lose everything for eternity. But the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I remember that was one of the first verses that I, that I love to quote to my friends. Because when I was a sinner, Christ sought me. Christ went and found me in the lowest point in my life. He rescued me when nobody would give a penny for me. He says, I am going to do something in your life. And I know this because he loved me even when I was a sinner. Society is willing for, to, for others to pay a price for their sins and wants great. Listen, think about this. And, and I'm going to include everyone. Society wants, when somebody else does wrong, oh, he needs to pay. Right? Look at this finger. We are quick to sing a lot of people. But if we mess up, oh, we want grace. I know you're not saying amen, but I know it happens. We want forgiveness when it's on me. But we're quick to judge others. That is not the way of God. Grace and mercy go hand in hand, and we need to give back what we have received. I'm going to give you a, a funny illustration. A woman who called police, uh, called the police department and complained that people were speeding on the streets of her neighborhood, endangering the lives of children they were walking through school. The next morning, she herself was stopped for speeding. But officer, 
she pleaded. I am the person who called yesterday to tell you about these Peters. Well then, ma'am, said the officer, handing her a ticket, you should be happy. We caught one of them. <laughs> when you break the law, when you break the law, you pay a penalty. It is the law. The law, no, no one is above the law. When we broke the law of God, we had to pay us a penalty. And the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. You're not alone. We all have sinned. The Bible says, I think it's Romans 3.23, for we all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody in this room has not sinned. We all have sinned. But you're in the right place. You're in the place where we are bestowing the grace and the mercy of God. And we believe that there's hope not only for you and me, but there's hope for the tens and the thousands around us that need this message of hope. Grace and mercy has to be the daily bread of people. In the midst of that penalty that we have to pay, we find this pearl of wisdom in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And it, is a, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Grace and salvation. See, we in Christ, we have those two precious words, I am saved by grace. Saved and grace. Look at what you're outlining, what it says. Faith in Christ is the only way of getting right with God, and no human effort can do it because grace is a gift from God. When God gives you a, a gift, he wants you to take care of it. Think about the, the gifts that you have received. I have, Gina, I have a little card that you gave me when you were probably nine years old, Mika. And I can tell because of the scribble, you didn't write that pretty. And the crayon, you were probably you were probably seven years old. And I have that little letter stored in a very safe place because I never want to lose it. Because it is a gift that she gave me, and it is valuable. When you have something that has been gifted to you that is valuable, valuable, you treat it with special care. To you, maybe an antique, a family heirloom, maybe a dress that your mom, or maybe a coat. Whatever the case may be, you care for it because it is precious. My friends, God's grace is a gift from us. We just read it. Grace is God giving himself to us without preconditions. What that tells me is in, that in the eyes of God, you and I have value. There's something that he sees that other people may not see. And I am not talking about uplifting your own self-esteem and saying, well, I am better than everyone else. God, deal with me. No, it is by grace. It is by what his son did on the cross that you have value. The value that you have is the image of God that he placed in you. And he wants to restore his relationship. But it can only be done when you receive the gift of grace. The word, the Greek word that we just read for, for gift is the word, and I don't speak Greek, so bear with me, doron. And that means it's a word or an expression of honor. When you honor someone, you doron. You give him that gift. What that tells me is that God, God sees you as valuable. That because God sees you with, a, with eyes of grace, he has bestowed us a gift that we must cherish. See, what happens is that so many times we become careless with the grace of God. Let me tell this, let me tell this side. Sometimes we become careless with the grace of God, and we abuse it. I was reading as I was studying for this sermon in, in Ephesians, I was reading a commentary where it said that it, it's, 
when we sin, listen, when we sin, it's not about breaking the law. And I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to do my best to remember what I just studied. I wasn't going to tell you, but I am going to, and I will do my best to remember the details. When you break the law, you pay a penalty. I'm going to give you this example of, of a man that is driving, and in his driving, he kills this young child that is riding his bicycle. The man goes to jail, and after a few years, he gets out of prison, and he has paid the penalty for breaking the law. Do you agree with me up until then? But there's something else that he has broken. Not only the law, but he broke the love of that mother who lost her child. See, when we fail and when we get careless with grace, we not only break the law, but we break the love that the Father had for us. And that's the one thing that we must realize and must, not out of guilt, but out of gratitude, we must remember that we cannot be careless with the grace that has been gifted to us. So I'm going to put you on the spot right now. What have you done with the grace that you have received? Are you sharing it with someone else? I know you are. You're a teacher. But you don't have to be a teacher to share the grace of God. The grace of God, Tommy, is displayed in an act of kindness. In an act of reaching out to somebody that is lower than you. Because you may say, Pastor, I'm struggling. But there's somebody in your life that God will place. And you need to give them that grace. Look for someone this week to come to your life. And pull them up by the grace of Christ. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to give the grace that freely has been given to you, brother. And I'm telling you, because it is personal for you, but it also can be for us. And it doesn't matter if you're a young child like Matthew or, the, or a young man like Isaiah. Grace does not differentiate, but we are, we are impregnated with this grace of God in us. When our lives, when our lives are filled with that grace, something happens. Fill this out. I think this is the last thing we're going to fill in that outline. Grace is a gift you cannot earn. Grace is a gift you cannot earn. it, And grace is free, but cost Jesus everything. Everything. I told you that grace moves you to gratitude, but also moves us into service, and it moves us into transformation. The majority of you in this place have been already saved because you received what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. You say, Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to take control of everything that I have. I declare that you are my Lord and Savior. And you become saved. But salvation is not something that it is once and done and it stops. It is something that happens for the rest of your life. It is something that, it, it, that you learn to navigate as you are getting older. I've been saved since I was 17 years old. Many, many moons ago. And, I'm, and God is still not done. But Philippians 1.6 says that he who began the good work will complete it. So I know that God is going to finish the work. Now, my question to you this morning is, where are you in that journey? We were all dead in our transgressions. And we are being transformed. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, transgressions made us alive together with Christ, and then in parentheses, by grace, 
you have been saved. When we came from death to life, that's the first transformation. But then the second transformation is, is as we begin to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us to be more like Christ. Once you truly realize that, once you truly realize that God is transforming you, you break away from the religious thinking that tells you you must do and do this and do that and do this and do that. Think about the Ten Commandments. You shall not do this, right? In the law, everything with you shall not do this. In Christ, in grace, it's, it says, it is done. It is finished. When, Je when Jesus was on the cross, the last word says, it is finished. The price has been paid in full. Mercy is wrapped around grace. There's a song that says, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. In conclusion this morning, I'm going to give you this statement. It's all about God's grace and mercy. And that, my friends, makes all the difference in the world. Have you received God's grace and mercy in your life? Where are you in that journey? You need to understand the depth and the height and the width of God's love for His people. But there may be someone in this place that has not experienced firsthand the grace of Christ. That you think and you maybe have thought for all your life that you needed to earn your way into heaven. I am here to tell you, you cannot earn your way into heaven. But God sent His Son to give you grace and give you mercy. If you have not made that decision to give your life to Jesus, Today is a day when you can make that decision to say, Jesus, I want to give you my life. And I know that I'm talking to people who are probably churchgoers for their, for their life, for life. But this is something personal. If you come with your parents and say, well, Pastor, I've been coming with my parents for so long, I, I think I'm saved. You, you cannot think that you're saved. You must be sure that you're saved. Just because my dad, you know, raised his hand and received the Lord, uh, it, it's, that's your dad. You need to make that choice. And if what I am saying resonates with you and say, Pastor, I think I need to make that decision. I'm here to tell you this is your morning. Would you receive the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you do, if you want to receive him for the very first time, I am going to ask you to raise your right hand and say, Pastor, I want Jesus in my life. Is there anyone here who wants to make that decision? Pastor, I want to yield it all to Jesus. I think I was very clear on that, right? That is all I can do. The outcome is the work of the Holy Spirit. Why don't you bow your heads and let us pray together. Father, thank you. How liberating it is to share this message of grace and mercy with your people. I pray that the seeds of your word will bear the right fruit at the right time. I have done my job. Now, Holy Spirit, you do yours. 
I pray that as we worship you, may we be recipients of your presence in everything we do. Thank you, Father, for showing up at CFC English every Sunday in giving us a glimpse of your glory. May we be transformed day by day by your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name. And God's people said, Amen. Love you. God bless you.